Lord, I just ask for the spirit of revelation of wisdom to come in here and just to fill our minds and uh, just open our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. I had, uh, the last two times I spoke, I spoke on the courts of heaven. And very, uh, it's just something that's really stirred, it's really impacted me as I've pressed into this. Uh, and this is the third and, uh, third and final message today on the courts of heaven. The first message I had was an introduction to the courts of heaven, and hopefully I've laid out biblical and scriptural evidence and reference on the courts. It's something I hadn't understood before and how important this is. And the second message was on the books of heaven. And I, I don't know if you know, but um, uh, there is a book about you in heaven that was created before the beginning of time. And there was a meeting in heaven, and we laid all this out per scripture. And that book has your name on it, and it contains your kingdom destiny, the year you would be born, uh, the destiny that the Father has for your life. And so this starts the spiritual warfare that we have of the enemy, of the accuser of the brethren, trying to go into the courts of heaven to keep you from walking in the destiny that God called you to from the beginning of time. And that's the purpose in the courts. That's where the books in heaven and the courts in heaven come together. Uh, and when you start putting these scriptures together, they're so powerful. And it's like so plain. It's like, I, I can't believe I didn't see this before. Uh, if you weren't there during these two messages, I encourage you to uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, New Bern Church TV. It has all of our messages, and it also has uh, uh, these, these two messages on there. So, uh, first one was introduction. Second one was the books. This is about... This message is about our part in it. We are a royal priesthood. You understand that, right? And um, uh, the way a priest functions and how we can operate in the courts of heaven. So we can get what's in our book. We can get what, and these books of heaven are the destiny not over people, but over churches, cities, regions, nations, states. And um, I you know, do you understand too that the government, that God has placed the church as the government on earth for kingdom values? Not like the government, not Republicans or, Republicans or Democrats. I'm not talking about that type of government. But I'm talking about the kingdom government upon the earth. That's what the church was, part of the reason the church was created for. So, when we talk about prayer, and we talk about going to the courts of heaven... We've always been, and I've, I've always understood the importance of being persistent in prayer. Uh, you pray and until you not give up. And I remember when I first got saved and I would read books, uh, you know, messages about Benny Hinn with Good Morning Holy Spirit and then what God did in his life and hearing about other people, I go, well, those guys did it for six hours, I'll do it for eight, right? But um, it says in Matthew, but prayer is not always about how much we pray, even though there's an important element in persistence in prayer. Uh, it says in Matthew 6, 7, when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetitions as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard. And then he says, pray then in this way, and he taught him the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven. So prayer is not always about the number of words that we use, but it's how we pray and where we pray. Often, when we pray, in reality, what we are doing is we are bringing our needs, and we're also bringing our complaints against the enemy who has been attacking us by bringing our needs because we have lack and we're bringing them before the Lord. And we're asking, and it could be for financial need, for physical healing, um, and we're bringing them before the Lord as a righteous judge. 
and asking him to step in on our behalf. Prayer, actually, we need to approach prayer this way. It's working with God. When we pray, and you're going to see this as we talk about this today, when we pray, we're working with God to see his kingdom purposes come to pass upon his life, upon this life. Because we know he's so good. And his plan for our life is so good. As good as I can think, I can't think as good as he is. He's gooder. He's gooder and gooder. And so when we trust in his goodness, I can lean back and I go, Lord, I just want your plan for my life. I want your plan for this church. I want your plan for the city, the state. Lord, I just want your plan. So as we learn to navigate into the courts of heaven, and the reason I'm bringing this up a third time is because I really felt impressed by the Lord, is look, this is not just a good sermon. This is not just a good message. But this is a kingdom revelation that we need to walk in. And I just want you to receive it that way. I want you to have a more effective prayer life. Amen. I want you to walk in the destiny that God's called you to walk in. Amen. I want you to be all you can be. Amen. To be all that the Lord has called you to. So it's like the best time to do this is now. There's no more delay. Let's unlock our kingdom destinies. Yeah. Corporately, individually and corporately, and let's begin to walk in this. And I believe this is a key. So the basis of this is when we pray, one of the things that we do is we enter into a conflict. Right? Because we're praying, and this is best illustrated in Daniel 10, 12. He said, Daniel, do not be afraid since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding, and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I come in response to them, but the prince of Persia resisted me 21 days, which is the enemy, a right? principality. So Daniel goes to pray. How many times have you prayed and you did not see the answer and got frustrated? Honestly? But what this shows us is that the spirit first day that Daniel prayed, the Lord heard his words. And then a spiritual conflict started. And that delayed the response. There is, was demonic forces resisting Daniel. And the same thing happens in our own, own a prayer life at some, at a lot. Especially when we're praying for our kingdom destiny. When, you know, when we're praying for our books to be realized within our life. There is demonic forces that are released and we're entering into a conflict. We do two things when we pray. We engage heaven and we enter into a conflict. And it's important to keep this in mind. It's not that God doesn't care about us. It's that, because sometimes you pray, Lord, I just, can't you hear me? I've, I've, I've got get these bills paid, this health issue. Lord, what, what's the answer? It's, it's not that he doesn't care. He's, he's a good, good father. But it's the conflict that's holding it up. And I'm telling you, God has given us kingdom revelation, wisdom and keys on how to win. And that's what this is about. That's why this is not just a good message. Because it affects every single one of us. So, when we pray, number one, we're engaging heaven and we're entering into a conflict. The question is, is where is this conflict? Where does this conflict happen? I, uh, as I was growing up um, in church, I was, it was my understanding that the conflict was on a battlefield is that, you know, we're going to war. Come on. Intercessors put their wedding dress and combat boots on. 
get the sword, <laughs> right? And, you know, you, you go into warfare, warfare, prayer. But there is a battlefield. But I want to tell you that it's decided in the courtroom first. And if you, if you didn't hear the first message, that introduction that lays out the scriptural uh, basis for this, please go back and listen to it. But prayer, you enter in, you, it's decided in the courtroom first, the courtroom of heaven. The battlefield comes after that. But I believe where we've made mistakes in the past, you can spend two years on a battlefield and accomplish the same thing you can accomplish in 15 minutes in the courtroom. Once you establish the legal precedent, once you remove the legal accusations of the enemy, of the accuser that is constantly accusing you, he's accuser of the brethren, and once you remove that in the courtroom, the battlefield becomes easy. It's kind of like uh, when I started going overseas, we started having a lot of demonic manifestations at, at these meetings. And I had to learn how to cast out demons. And uh, the, your, your first thing was, inclination was to holler and scream at them. Get out, get out, get out, get out. But then I learned, no, there's a better way. And it was calm. And it was just talking to the person and closing the doors. And once you close the doors, once you took away the enemy's authority, he had to leave. And it was easy. You could just go, go, that's it. No exorcism movie, no spinning heads, none of that stuff. No pea soup, just go. Once you remove the enemy's authority, once you go to court, into the courtrooms of heaven, and remove the authority the enemy has, the legal right he has to block the promises of God over your life, once you remove that, it becomes easy. The battlefield, it's, it's, it's a one-stop shop at the battlefield. You kick and he cries. Come on. So, the way we, this is important, because the way we behave on a battlefield and the way we behave in a courtroom are totally different. And what we need to do is learn how to behave in the courtroom. Learn how when we're contending for healing, when we're contending for the promises that God has over our lives, when, when we're praying God's will and it's not happening, there has to be, like with, with, with healing, I believe with all my heart, it's God's will to heal absolutely every single person. Period. You have to believe that if you're going to operate in healing. But it doesn't always happen. And I found that unforgiveness is one of the biggest blocks to, to healing. And if you can, so you go into some type of counseling with a person, and then you, you remove the blockage to healing, and then many, many times I've seen healing come because of that. How many have ever stepped out in something, whether it's gone on a mission trip or like we're moving into this new building or you're stepping out in a kingdom, stepping out in the kingdom and you, you have this promise, you feel like you're supposed to do, that, to do this and you step out and all of a sudden this backlash comes. It's like all hell breaks loose over your life. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's like, you know it's God's will, but you're experiencing all of this backlash. I believe the reason is, is because we have not bothered to get the legal stuff in place first. To disarm the enemy in, in the court, 
in the court of heaven. Because when you do that, then we can march right onto the battlefield and it becomes easy. Uh, this is demonstrated or illustrated in Revelation 19, 1, 1, 11. And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he who sat on it was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. I want you to... And notice the order. He judges, judicial, courtroom activity first, and then he wages war second. Courtroom first, battlefield second. So what the Lord's doing, he's getting the judicial things in place first, and then he's going into the battlefield second. I've gotten so used, that, especially going overseas, it seemed like if I would plan a mission trip or something, it's just that the week before was horrible. And uh, almost got used to the backlash and thought it was a normal activity, a normal thing of being a Christian, something I had to deal with. But it's not true. We don't have to deal with backlash. A couple of these verses I've repeated uh, the first time, but I need to go over them again to reinforce what we're talking about here. On Luke 18, uh, starting in verse 1, it's a very good example of how to pray, which illustrates about the courtroom. Uh, 18.1, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and to not and to not give up. So the reason of this parable is so they would not lose heart and not give up. This is not a cheer leading session by Jesus. This is not, keep going guys, I know it's hard, but you can do it. It's, it's not like that. What the Lord's doing is releasing a kingdom secret. He's releasing the kingdom revelation to them. And he said, this is how you pray and don't give up. Because the main reason you don't give up in prayer is because you get answers. If you never got your prayers answered, you would give up. So what the Lord's saying is, this is how you do it and don't give up. He was teaching them a secret, a kingdom secret that's going to make their prayer life more effective. A key. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time, he refused. But finally, he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come back and attack me. And then the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. He will see that they get justice. This is a promise that you will get justice quickly. Okay, so number one. In this parable, Jesus puts prayer in a judicial system. He puts it in the context of a judicial system. And he says, when you pray, you step into a courtroom, into a judicial system with a judge. Number two, in no time in this parable does the woman speak to her adversary. Amen. She didn't bind the devil. She didn't do any of that stuff. Because the woman understood that the success of her case 
rested in not beating up the adversary, but getting a verdict from the judge. She knew that the verdict from the judge would defeat her adversary. That's why it wasn't worth even speaking to the adversary. The woman realized that the real conflict she was engaged in was not on the battlefield, but in the courtroom. Once you get the judgment, then you can step onto the battlefield and make decrees at that point. You can decree the judgment that God gave you. And this works. The, the, the times I've really studied this is like when I feel there's an injustice, I'll start to pray and, and I'll say, Lord, I'm just coming before you. I'm coming before your court, Lord. Number one, search my heart. I'm going to explain this more in a bit. But I search my heart. I remove anything that could be against me. And then once, though, you can feel it lift. That's, that's the best thing. You, just, you can feel the release in your spirit. You can feel the judgment come on your behalf. It just... And then you know you can make decrees. And once you do that, things happen. And the third thing, he says, I will see that they get justice and quickly. This is when I said, two years on the battlefield, you can get the same thing in the courtroom in 15 minutes. Speedily. This is the promise of the Lord. Do not think that when you pray a prayer... And it's in the will of the Lord. You're praying a kingdom prayer, not, you know, not a solely selfish prayer, but when a kingdom prayer that you know is the will of the Lord, that you should, it's your right to get justice quickly. And if you're not, you should recognize that something legal is stopping you. So this is our role, and it can be compared to the role of the priest in the Old Testament. So, what was the role of the priests in the Old Testament? The role of the priests was to make offerings that gave God the legal right to bless his people. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go behind the veil into the Holy of Holies with the blood. He would sprinkle the blood upon the altar, upon the mercy seat. The blood, which I'm going to show you in a bit, testifies in court. We were overcome by the blood and our testimony. The blood testifies in court. So the high priest goes in, sprinkles the blood. The testimony of the blood grants God the Father the legal right to roll back the sins of Israel for one year back then. They rolled back the sins for a year so God could bless them and not judge them. That was the role of the high priest. Revelation 5.10 says, talking about you and me, and you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests before our God, and they will reign upon the earth. We are a kingdom of priests. We need to understand that it's always God's heart to show mercy. It's always God's heart to show love. He needs a legal right to do it. The role of us as priests is so critical. Ezekiel 22.30 says this, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap. On behalf of the land, so I would not have to destroy it, but I found no one. That's sad. 
He's looking for priests to build up the wall and to stand in the gap for our city, for your city. So he can bless. We got to understand that as priests, we're a governmental people. We rule and reign. Because of that, you hold the key to your city. You hold the key to nations. If you have one ounce of intercession in you, this should stir you. That's a Shabbat. Daniel 7, starting in verse 9. just want to repeat this from the first time. It's, this is the most excellent example of the courts of heaven. And Daniel is taken up in an encounter. And he says this, And as I looked, thrones were placed. Thrones have to do with a judicial system. Thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days, Father God, took his seat. It's like the judge coming in. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair on his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery, fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him, and the court set in judgment, and the books were opened. So what happens, all this throne room activity that we see, it's the court setting in judgment, and the books were open. Revelation 4 and 5 talks about the 24 thrones with the elders. See, it's Ephesians 2, 6 says, God raised us up with him to be seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God in his love, wisdom, and mercy has allowed us to be seated with him in the court of heaven as our feet are upon the earth. You are an important part as a priest, as the royal priesthood. We are an important part of the court of heaven. It said, the court set in judgment and the books were open. Which means that the books are an incredibly important part of the court system in heaven. That means every decision that's made is going to come out of those books. Which contain the destiny of everything from individuals to nations. As priests, we are called to put everything back in order so that can happen. Yeah. Stand in the gap. Revelation 10, starting with verse 11... John is told to eat a scroll, which is a book in heaven, right? So he says, eat the scroll. And what happens? You must again prophesy about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. He could not prophesy until he ate the book, the scroll. He wasn't able to prophesy until then, which means that book was about, the books that he was eating, the scroll, was about nations, languages, and kings. Time to get hungry. Revelation 5. Thank you, Lord. Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? Again, this is talking about the books in heaven. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth, was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I became, began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And we know because Jesus overcame, Jesus was able to open the books, right? 
He was able to open the scrolls. Why was John weeping? It says, Now I became, I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll. John knew, I believe, that the court system in heaven could not operate until the books were open. The court set and the books were open. When the books are open, it grants God the legal right to reclaim planet Earth. It unlocks the kingdom destinies. Now we know the books were open because Jesus overcame. But I also believe that John's tears had something to do with it too. Your prayers, your intercession. Your tears over your city, over this church, over the, the lives of your family members make a difference. He wept loudly. I want to tell you about the importance of witnesses in the courtroom of heaven. 2 Corinthians 13 tells us the principle of two or three witnesses. It says, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. Okay, Satan, the enemy, is continually uh, accusing us. He accuses the brethren. And Jesus is continually interceding for us. These two voices are looking for another voice upon the earth to come into agreement with. Just let you think about that for a second. And the key is, who are you going to come into agreement with? By the voice of two or three witnesses, a thing will be established. Man, I'm feeling the presence of God. Daniel 7.25 talks about the power of the courts. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. That spiritual warrior. You ever feel wore out? Wow. He shall speak words against the Most High and he's going to wear you out. And shall think to change the times and the law. The book. He shall think to change what's in your book, the times and the law. And they shall be given unto his hand for a time, times, and time a half. But the court shall set in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away. Yes. Ah. To be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given unto the people of the saints of the Most High, and his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. In these verses, the saints go from a place of defeat and being worn out to a place of dominion because the court set in judgment. And no one yelled at the devil. It was all in the courts. When we intercede, when we pray, I want you to know that we are not the only voice. Part of our activity in the courtroom of heaven is to come into agreement with the voices that are already there. And this is found in Hebrews 12, 22 through 24. But you are to come unto Mount Zion... And unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, and to the assembly, and to the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Abel. So it starts out here. When you come into Mount Zion, 
Whenever you talk, when you, whenever the word is talking about mountains, it's talking about governmental authority on earth. And this is found in Isaiah 2. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. Which means the government, the house of the Lord, the government of the church shall be established over all the other governments and shall be lifted above the hills and all the nations will flow into it. And many people will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. For he may teach us his ways that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall come the law. Out of Zion comes the law. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many nations. Judicial again. He will judge between the nations. So let's go back to Hebrews. But ye have come on the Mount Zion which shall go forth the law, judicial, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and unto the innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly. These are the voices in the courtroom that we come into agreement with. The general assembly, the church of the firstborn, the judge, God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. There were eight voices in these two verses that, the, that, that tells us that speak in the court of heaven, Mount Zion. And we are called to come into agreement. So I want you to know when you pray, you're not alone. You're not doing this. When you intercede, when you pray for your family, for your city, for a friend, you're not alone. You're coming into agreement. So let me start at the bottom of verse 24 and work my way up. The first voice is the blood of sprinkling. That speaks better things than that of Abel. The first voice is the blood. The testimony of Abel's blood convicted Cain. Read Genesis 4. The blood cried out. God sentenced Cain based upon the testimony of the blood. The blood of Jesus is a much better sacrifice. His blood cries, just as the blood of Cain cried out, the blood of Jesus cries out for your redemption. It cries out for your restoration. It cries out for your healing. It cr cries out for your family being restored. We come into agreement with that. It, 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 it cries out to the whole earth being filled with the glory of the Lord. Revelation 12, 11, and they defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. I know when I go into the court of heaven, I come into full agreement with what the blood is saying about me. Anything I need forgiveness for, I receive it. Anything I need cleansing for, I get it. Anything I need to repent for, I get it. Without the blood, you have no right, no ability to stand in the court of heaven. The second voice, Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Mediator is a term used in the judicial system. It's a legal term. It means to see if you can come to agreement before you bother the court. Jesus functions as our mediator. So God can release all the promises. He's the mediator of the new covenant. So God can release all the promises of the new covenant over our life. 
The third voice. The spirits of just men made perfect. This refers to the great cloud of witnesses that are in heaven. Just because someone dies and goes to heaven does not mean they stop their kingdom purpose. The fourth voice, God, the judge of all. He's not called father here. He's called the judge. But he's a righteous judge who loves you. And he's waiting for a legal right to give you justice. The fifth voice, the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. There is a church in heaven. Governmental authority in heaven, the ecclesia. Some churches are called, remember I said the government, God's government upon earth is the church. Some churches are called to govern cities, nations, and regions. Revelation 2, it says, when Jesus is talking to the church in Ephesus, he says, because you have forsaken your first love, consider how far you have fallen, repent and do the things you did at first, and if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand. Which means a church can be recognized on earth and not recognized in heaven because its lampstand was removed. The sixth voice, the general assembly. And to the general assembly. General assembly means mass eating, mass meeting. And it's a picture of the multitudes around the throne worshiping the Lord. The general assembly. Worship is an important part of the courts of heaven. It's a court system of heaven. When you worship, you begin to operate governmentally. It's powerful. The seventh voice, the innumerable company of angels. There are many ranks of angels and they're working on assignments for you. The eighth voice, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. God wants to reform your city by causing your city to look like a heavenly city. Many cities look like the principality that's over them. God wants to imprint the heavenly Jerusalem upon your, our city. Amen. The gorgeous beauty beauty of the heavenly Jerusalem to come upon and printed on our city. And of all, above all, that's a picture of heaven invading earth. You know, it's like, search my heart, Lord, and show me, remove things. I, Holiness is so powerful, guys. And I, I think there's so much freedom in it. You know, it's, it's not, holiness has been portrayed as a set of rules that you have to follow, and it's a real pain in the rear to, to do. But you'll never experience true freedom until you get free from all sin. And holiness, it's just, it's so powerful. Zechariah 3, 7 says, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you walk in my ways and if you keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and you shall have charge over my courts. And I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here in the courts. Here now, Oh, Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you. If you really, really want to get free, get into holiness. 
It gives you the power to stand in the courts and gives you access. Because the first thing you do when you go into court is you have to answer the accusations against you. But, you know, like what right does he have to be here? But by the blood. The first court, throne, which represents court, the first one we should go to is the court of Hebrews 4.16 and to come boldly before the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in times of need. Think about that verse. Why do we go before the throne of grace? That we can receive mercy and to find grace to help others in time of need. When we start functioning as the church of what we're called to, and, and not that we aren't, I'm just saying in general, begin to walk in a governmental authority, and you're going to see incredible kingdom advances in this area. Come on, we're talking about cancer-free zones, we're talking about just incredible stuff happening. And when you start to operate in this, you're going to see the beauty of heaven come upon your city. And I want you to know the Holy Spirit is here to guide you every step of the way. He has the answers. You say, Holy Spirit, just help me. Teach me how to do this. Help me how to find mercy for those in need. How to help others for those in need. Teach me how to go into the courts and bring verdicts back. Show. Jesus is interceding that your book comes to pass in your life. The kingdom destinies. It's about running the race, as Paul said. And above all, we want to finish strong. Love what Reinhard Bonnke said when they asked him if he was going to slow down and retire. And he said, the airplane is at its fastest just as it leaves the ground. (laughs) I want to be at my fastest until my race is done. Let's just stand up. (sighs) She and the Holy Spirit, I just ask for a revelation of who we are as a royal priesthood. Lord, that Holy Spirit, teach us to walk fully into our role as priests before our God. Teach us, Lord, how to navigate in your court system in heaven. how to remove accusations, how to bring down lies, and Lord, and see the kingdom advance in our life, in our city, our regent, our church. Wow. Man, just this let the, I just feel the Lord coming. Lord, make us wise. Lord, I just ask for a spirit of wisdom upon each of us over these matters. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Stir us up, God, to walk into our role as priests and kings. Lord, teach us how to wage spiritual conflict effectively.
Thank you, Lord. Come on, just let the Lord touch you right now. I just want you to experience God right now. Thank you, Lord. You know, I want to so much go from just a good message, just a revelation that impacts, makes a difference. Lord, we want to make a difference while we're here. We want to fulfill the kingdom destiny that you have written in our book for each of us. Lord, I thank you that you were worthy to open that book. Now, Lord, we will add our tears to it like John. We will intercede for our families, church, city, society, to see heaven invade earth. You are more than victorious. You were called to this. You were created for this. You are created for this. You were created to walk in the kingdom of authority above a level you haven't even experienced yet. Who are these that have turned the world upside down? We're called to this. Nothing less will do. I thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord.